With only so much room on your roof for solar panels, how can you make sure you're making the best you can from that space? Solar panel efficiency ratings play a big part in this video and I'll show you why. Hi there, I'm Gary and welcome back to my channel, Gary Does Solar. If you're looking to get solar panels for your property, you'll quickly find out there's so much to learn. And it can sometimes feel like a bit of a minefield. One wrong decision about what equipment to buy and who to go with for your installation. And it could be thousands of your hard earned cash down the drain. Hopefully my videos help you understand the technologies involved and give guidance on the equipment needed. And if you're in the UK and need help finding an installer, my solar installer directory is a very popular service, having already helped hundreds of people since its launch a couple of months ago. But when it comes down to the solar panels themselves, with so much choice in the market, how do you know which are the most appropriate solar panels for your roof? Sure, you could just let your solar installer select the panels for you. And I would certainly trust the installers in my directory. They know what they're doing. But I've seen all too often installers are pushing outdated panels on customers just to clear old stock, essentially robbing your roof of its maximum power generation potential. It's worth then spending a little time understanding the technology behind solar panels so that you'll have a good idea what might be best for you before you engage with installers. And that's what we'll be covering in this video. And it won't take long. Let's get into it. If you do a search for solar panels online, you'll find that there are literally hundreds of options to choose from, from brands such as Ico, Longi, Perlite, Jinko, JA Solar, Trina, Rhea, and the list goes on. Let's have a look at just two panels available today. The first is from Trina, and it's the Trina Vertex S Plus 500 Watt Dual Glass Full Black N-Type Mono. And the second is from Ico. It's called the Ico Neostar 2S 465 Watt All Black ABC N-Type Mono. Now, aside from the techno babble, I wouldn't blame you if you had a preference for the Trina, as it has an extra 35 watts of power generation. 500 watts compared to 465 watts. And that extra generation would soon add up with an array of say 10 or more panels. But actually, in terms of generation, the Ico is the better of the two. Why is that? Well, it's all down to the physical size of the panel. You see that although the Trina panel is the same width as the Ico panel, at 1134 millimeters, it's longer than the Ico by about 204 millimeters. And so with that extra footprint, it's able to generate more power, 500 watts instead of 465 watts. But even that's not the whole story. Let's calculate the generation per square meter for each of these two panels. To do that, we first convert millimeters into meters, then multiply the width by the length to get the respective panel areas. For the Trina panel, it works out to be 2.2238 square meters. And for the Ico panel, it's 1.9924 square meters. If we now divide their respective power outputs by those areas, we get the generation per square meter. For the Trina panel, it works out to be 224.84 watts per square meter. And for the Ico panel, it's 233.37 watts per square meter. So you can see that the Ico panel is actually more efficient at converting light into electricity than the Trina panel. Let's go one step further and express the efficiency of each panel as a percentage of the maximum possible solar energy that can be converted into electricity. That maximum happens to be 1000 watts per square meter under ideal conditions. So for the Trina panel, the efficiency is approximately 22.48%. And for the Ico panel, it's slightly higher at approximately 23.33%. This metric is actually very useful as it allows easy comparison between panels. And for that reason, you'll often see it quoted by manufacturers and retailers. And you'll not be surprised to hear that the efficiency of solar panels has been steadily increasing over the years. Take a look at this chart from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory or NREL. It looks quite complex on first sight, but you can see time running along the X axis from 1975 to the present day and solar cell efficiency running up the Y axis. The coloured lines and shapes represent the various technologies used to manufacture the solar cells that go into solar panels. Those technologies will be the subject of a future video, but for now what's clear is that over time solar cell efficiency is improving, and for some technologies that rate of improvement is higher than others. 
It's worth noting at this point that solar cell efficiency differs from solar panel efficiency, which is typically 2 to 5% lower. And this difference arises because panels include components beyond the cells themselves, such as wiring that introduces electrical resistance losses, uh, inactive areas like gaps between cells and even the frame, and also the glass covering that reflects or absorbs some of the sunlight. At the time of recording this video, Longi had just launched its latest solar panel offering with a claimed efficiency of nearly 26%. Now that might not sound like much of an increase compared to today's typical solar panel efficiencies of 23%, but it's actually a 13% increase in power output. So that's potentially 13% more energy generation over its expected 25 year lifetime. Or to put it another way, every 1% increase in efficiency over 23% is roughly a 4.35% boost in power output. This means that even small efficiency gains can significantly increase the energy a solar panel generates over its lifetime. The opposite is also true. Every 1% decrease in efficiency below 23% leads to a roughly 4.35% reduction in power output. And just to labour the point, let's quickly use my solar asthma modelling tool to see what the impact of an increase or decrease would be. Let's imagine 12 of those Trina panels on a south facing roof in London. You can see that a setup like that would generate around 5,926 kilowatt hours of energy over a year. Now if we boost the efficiency of those panels by just 1%, which as we've seen increases power output by 4.35%, you'd produce an extra 257 kilowatt hours annually, which equates to over 6,000 kilowatt hours over a 25 year period assuming that the panels degrade by say half a percent every year. And at say 25 pence per kilowatt hour, that additional generation will save you a whopping £1,500 in today's money by avoiding grid electricity costs. So take it from me, these efficiency ratings are actually really important. And if your installer is quoting you a specific panel type, make sure its efficiency rating is competitive in the market before you accept it. Now before we move on, I want to address a couple of questions that you might have on panel efficiency. Firstly, if efficiency is steadily rising all the time, should you wait a year or two to benefit from the better efficiencies that will be available then? It's a good question, and assuming that you're purely interested in a financial return, it's something you could easily run the numbers on, even using my solar asthma utility. Would the increased generation outweigh the loss of savings if you didn't invest now? My gut feel, looking at the NREL chart again, based on how much solar panel efficiency ratings have increased over the last couple of years, is no. But hey, you never know. There's a technology called perovskite, and that could be a real game changer. Check out Artisan's video on that technology here. The link is in the description. And secondly, is there a limit to the efficiency that a solar panel can have? Well, there is a theoretical limit to solar panel efficiency, primarily determined by physics, it's called the shockley kaiser limit, and it happens to be 33.7%. And it applies to single junction solar cells, which are the most common type of cell today. But if you look back at the NREL chart, you can see there are already some technologies ahead of that efficiency. And that's because they're using multiple junction cells, where multiple layers of materials are stacked together to capture a broader spectrum of sunlight. The absolute theoretical limit for solar panel efficiency is around 86.8%. And although this limit is considered unattainable due to physics, I just love humanity's relentless ingenuity that pushes us ever closer to it. Okay, now that we've looked at the efficiency ratings of solar panels, let's see how that links to your available roof space. You see, it's not just about covering every possible inch of your roof with solar panels. It's also about ensuring that those panels have high efficiency in order to maximise your energy generation. And this is where the fun starts, so I hope you're good at Tetris. Here's an example roof space which is almost rectangular, but it has a chimney stack at the top right. We could have a go at fitting panels onto it, but first we need to add a margin which is required in some countries. In the UK I think it's 400mm. Let's see how many panels of this size that we can fit. We can get five along the bottom and another five along the top. Actually we can't. That last panel, you can see it breaches the boundary, so we'll need to remove it. Okay, so that's nine panels in total. We could centre it to make it more aesthetically pleasing, 
but remember there will be shadowing from the chimney, so keeping the panels away is probably a better idea. We might be able to get more than nine panels if we place them in landscape instead of portrait. We can get three along the bottom, then another two rows of three on top of that, so that's nine. But we can get one more on the right if we place that panel in portrait, so that's ten. Can we get another one on top? Not quite, but there is provision in some countries to breach that roof margin, provided extra precautions are taken, including adding additional rails to counteract any wind shear, for example. Let's try that and move the whole array down a little bit. Now we have 11 panels. The trouble is that last panel is very close to the chimney, and so it will be prone to shading and therefore reduce production. Is there any other way we can get 11 panels on this roof without being too close to the chimney? How about we pause the video for a few moments? I want to see if you're a Tetris expert. OK, here we go. Five panels along the bottom placed in portrait, and then two rows of three panels placed above that in landscape. Well done if you managed to work that out. But can we improve on this further? Actually, I think we can. Let's try with a larger solar panel, making sure it has the same or an even better efficiency rating. With this larger panel, which might be one more suited to commercial installations, we can fit five across the bottom without any gaps. We can then fit another row of four on top, all away from the chimney. Now it's not as many panels as before, but this is where the efficiency rating is important. If the rating of this panel is at least the same as the smaller panel, we immediately know that we'll get more generation because there's less available roof space remaining. And you can see that if we show the previous layout alongside this one for comparison. Now your installer should be able to do all of this Tetris stuff for you, but they're not infallible. My own installer calculated I would only be able to get 15 panels on my roof, which admittedly is quite complex because it has a number of Velux windows. But I showed that if they used Perlite Delta panels in a particular arrangement, they could fit 17, and that's what happened. So I'd say it's well worth spending some time on it. And there are a number of online tools available to make the task easier, including EasyPV. And it's worth bearing in mind, even if you come up with the ideal panel layout, there may still be some constraints depending on the solar equipment, particularly inverters, which those panels will be attached to. Again, a good installer will know how to help you with all of this. All right, hopefully in this video, I've been able to show you that understanding and comparing the efficiency rating across solar panels is the key to maximizing the potential of your roof space. Let me know what you think in the comments. And before I go, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And a huge thank you to all my Patreon supporters who make this channel possible, including these here on the terawatt and gigawatt tiers. I'll see you again in my next video.